Okay, Hi. we are live on air. Welcome everybody to our very first Google Hangout with um, Karina Birch, from who is the uh, co-owner of Rocky Mountain Soap Company. We also have with us today uh, Maggie McDonald, who is the campaigner, writer, and um, and uh, from the <laughs> sorry from the environmental defense. We have Lily C, who is the founder and CEO of Think Dirty. And we also have uh, Tara Martinson, who is Rocky Mountain Soap Company's uh, own herbalist. Um, did you guys want to quickly just speak a little bit about yourself and, um, and why we're all here today for the natural and not so natural hangout? Uh, start with Lily. Sure. Um, I'm here, happy to introduce to um, the audience, if you don't already know about Think Dirty app. Um, obviously, we support companies that are manufacturing non-toxic products, and we educate consumers about the ingredients. So I thought having this hangout is the best way to educate the people about our common mission together and answer any question that anyone might have. And Maggie from Environmental Defense. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here tonight. Uh, we at Environmental Defense work to reduce pollution and we're interested in making uh, healthier environments for all Canadians. One of our big projects is to work on cosmetics and detoxing cosmetics. You can find resources about this for consumers at justbeautiful.ca, but we also work uh, to network businesses together that are doing the right thing. So companies like Rocky Mountain who are doing business in a way that's healthier, more sustainable, greener. Uh, we do work to highlight to consumers that there are safe alternatives like Rocky Mountain and also to uh, encourage government and business to take steps, uh, e larger businesses as well, to change their formulations. And uh, we're very keen to work uh, with Canadians on this issue and also to network with companies like Rocky Mountain to highlight the good work you're doing. Great. And Tara, you have a really cool job at Rocky. Did you want to speak a little bit about what you do for us at Rocky Mountain Soap Company? Sure. Um, happy to be here as well. Um, I started with Rocky a little over five years ago, and I was very passionate about natural then, and had um, been in the industry already for about 15 years, um, making natural bath and body products for myself, animals. Um, I was excited to start with Rocky and. Uh, um, just get more people familiar with what they're using on their skin um, because I've been doing it for so long. I had that many people were using a lot of um, products still and what they were using on their skin. So it, uh, it makes me feel good to know that we're shifting how people look at uh, bath and body care and, and just in the bigger picture of uh, what toxins may be going in down the drain and everything else that goes along with that. And lastly, uh, Karina Birch, who is the co-owner of Rocky Mountain Soap Company. Yeah, thanks, Nicola. So I'm excited to be here as well. It's the first time that Lily and Maggie and Tara and us and you have sat down together to have this discussion. So it's a pivotal point for us to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, our passion is to create natural bath and body products. So it's great to be able to take that, um, to include some of our partners in that because to us it's important that not just we're doing it, but other people start to join what we're doing. And it's great to have the dialogue with our customers as well and people out there in Canada who want to, to know more. So this is a great opportunity to bring all of us together to start to have some of these important conversations that will hopefully create some of the shifts that Maggie and, and Lily have mentioned. So we we put out uh, to the uh, Rocky Mountain Soap Company uh, customers what they wanted to know mostly about natural product because you know we've heard about the, tea, the term of greenwashing and um, how sub companies are allowed to put natural and organic when in fact many of the products don't have natural or organic ingredients and they do have some of the toxins in it. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to start with um, with Tara and we're going to talk a little bit about the ingredients, especially the ones that we use at Rocky. So um, Tara, we've had a lot of questions about people on their um, different skin conditions. Are there certain um, Oh, maybe we should talk about the ingredients first. What are some of the really bad ingredients and why we avoid them at Rocky Mountain Soap Company? Um, I'd say the main ones would be uh, synthetic foaming agents, 
um, synthetic fragrances, um, things that, uh, and preservatives would be the other one based on petrochemicals. We, uh, those are three big categories that we can avoid uh, that I would like to watch. So then um, one of the questions then would, um, is well, which, which chemicals are bad? So we know that phthalates are bad. Um, anything else that you'd like to add that? So um, why are they bad? I don't know there's research around a 1962 study, but is there anything else you could add to that? Um, well, there's lots of, <laughs> lots and lots of studies we could, we could add. Um, things that um, persist in the body are never, never good if it's not natural for your body to hang on to those things. Um, lots of different studies will link uh, cancer phthalates and um, um, irritation of the skin and um, you know most people will just think about it in terms of topical if it's not irritating their skin it's fine but it certainly goes further than that and deeper into the body um, especially when you're using something like uh, an underarm deodorant every single day um, in the same part of your body and uh, even worse if you're blocking the sweat so the toxins to release through um, using an antiperspirant um, yeah, there's many, many. There's we have a huge, huge red list of ingredients that we won't allow. Um, sometimes it's for environmental reasons. Sometimes it's for how it affects the body. Um, sometimes it's for sustainability. Um, is that sort of is that what you were looking for? <laughs> yeah. Well, and then one of the questions, then, if we're not using some of the sulfates, then for a foaming agent, what does Rocky use then for a foaming agent? You know, because we have shampoos and soaps and and so what is that if we're not using the, um, the chemicals? Uh, well, we use good old-fashioned soap. Um, people think that there is a foaming agent added, but when you mix the uh, base vegetable oils with lye, it creates a new product, which is soap. And it is not, um, I guess it's, it's, it's so foreign for a lot of people because we were brought up with these detergent-based hand cleansers, um, jerkins and things like that, that are just so normal and uh, we haven't really thought about what soap is and so a lot of people will uh, email us and ask us what we use as a foaming agent um, but that's what happens when you make soap you did lathers um, now the lather will vary depending on which kind of base oils you use sometimes you'll get a really big poofy lather with uh, longer lasting bubbles sometimes you'll get a very gentle lather so you can you can fine-tune the soap whether it's a soap or a shampoo uh, depending on which base oils you use and whether you super fat the soap meaning adding extra extra oil that is supposed to be left in there without reacting with the lye. Right. So that was another question that someone asked then what is a super fatted soap and do we have super fatted soaps at Rocky? Yes, yeah. We typically most of our soaps would be considered super fatted. And so what is a super fat? Uh, allowing there to be excess unreacted uh, oils in the soap so that it's more moisturizing for the skin. Gotcha. Um, so the next one is, is then, what is the difference then, and this probably could be a question for everyone, what is the difference when products say natural or organic? Um, you know, are they the same? Are they different? I can, I can jump in a little bit um, because in our app what we have been doing is we actually would make a remark on company that has gone through some sort of class action lawsuit by false advertising. So one perfect example is there's a brand called uh, Organics and uh, when you look at the ingredients label actually nothing actually is organic. So the confusion of organic and natural is um, Basically, most people can claim it, but I think in Canada, there's actually a uh, stricter uh, restriction. Um, uh, I think 90 to 100% uh, organic, then you can actually um, call yourself organic. Um, in the U.S., it's actually really lax. There's actually no definition. And um, also, the FDA, interestingly, have refused to actually define what's the definition of natural. So that makes the uh, task of actually claiming something natural or organic even like more murky. So what we have been doing in our app is um, anyone report to us. There's um, some sort of class action lawsuit, um, for example, another interesting one is um, I think actually, yeah, sorry, organics, which is the one that I mentioned. Um, we would make a at a footnote in each of the product that going through some sort of false misleading advertising claim actually let the 
user know about that? So in the U.S., definitely FDA declined to define. Um, I think in Canada, there's a little bit of definition uh, when it comes to organic, but the word natural is basically a free-for-all. So you can see, for example, um, some brand would say they have the main brand and then just add the word naturals, and then that might give the you know greenwashing effect and people just quick read on the front of the branding and they could think that is natural. Um, so that's why actually flipping the back, look at the ingredients and you know even better maybe use our app that definitely you would learn which one is genuinely passed the natural test uh, versus they don't. Mm -hmm. um, if I may jump in, there's some helpful definitions at uh, healthycanadians.gc.ca about what the Canadian regulations are. Uh, so there is a specific definition of organic, um, and I'm, I'm quoting now from this site, but organic, and this is for cosmetics, organic is a term that means uh, that a plant or other natural material is certified to be produced without pesticides. So usually um, the standards can vary from province to province, but generally if it's labeled as organic, that means that it's made from greater, greater than 95% organic ingredients. Individual ingredients can also be labeled organic if they meet that standard. So that's just some information about specifically what that means in the Canadian context. Um, you, how would that is uh, policed or, or checked into, that's, uh, it's, it's not really clear. Um, and I would uh, support what Lily has said about checking uh, ingredient labels and becoming a savvy label reader, which is why apps like Think Dirty are very helpful uh, because it can be difficult to, to navigate claims. And there is a, a difference between natural and organic. Uh, so it, uh, it, in, in Canada, it relates to the use of pesticides specifically. I'll just add a little bit to that too, Nicolette, very quickly, but um, just to further on Maggie's point and add for those people who are listening who are looking to make it easier to, to read labels or to navigate through different companies and, 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 and their, um, I guess, integrity to natural, obviously Think Dirty is a great app uh, to do that for you. There's also a number of, of third-party certifications that are credible. Um, Tara, you you can jump on jump in if I'm missing some, but Natru, Eco, mm -hmm. there's a number of uh, Natural Products Association. All of those start to pave the way to to trusting brands more and more. We've chosen to create our own guidelines because at the at the time we felt ours was stricter than the ones that we were looking at to certify through. But so I think if you're you know if you're looking at a company for the first time and you don't know their ethos or, or, or how they're formulating products, certainly looking to, you know, either think dirty or a third party certification is an, a good way to go as well. Yeah, so one more note on the notification, uh, sorry, certification. Um, if a company do have certification, uh, we also um, list them in our app and we also explain the criteria for each uh, certification as well because they do vary. Um, they're just like everything else, they're higher quality sort of certifier versus some lower quality which the minimal requirement for organic content is pretty low. So not all certifiers are created equal, so we actually uh, do explain what each certifier means as well in our app. Um, so if you see something with the little cert certifier label, if you tap further, we actually have a full panel explaining what they mean as well. So then that begs the question then of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, well, what are the government laws and restrictions? So I'm getting the impression that this is not very well regulated. Hmm. Well, it's... And, uh, and can they label natural and they can't? Sorry, do you mind going over that again? Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's um, there's It could be a little bit clearer what the guidelines are there. Um, so there is information that has to be on a label for cosmetics in Canada. Uh, not fragrance, uh, but other ingredients have to be on the label. Now, fortunately, uh, uh, apart from this natural question about what's uh, what's labeled in the fragrances, companies like Rocky Mountain and there are other businesses as well that do offer up that information about what's in the fragrance. So we uh, encourage people to purchase products where they can find out uh, what the fragrance ingredients as well as the other ingredients are. Um, 
but it can be kind of unclear about um, about what can be called natural or not in terms of cosmetics. Uh, so that's a tricky thing. And uh, and as the website mentioned, the the regulations about what can be labeled organic vary from province to province. So I think because this is um, a, a more recent area of interest for consumers, the regulations aren't. Uh, it's not the same from province to province yet, and there's not a lot of clarity. So it's um, we really appreciate it when businesses are um, you know taking leadership here to uh, to demonstrate where their products uh, where their product ingredients are coming from and to offer up this information to consumers but right now it's a question of um, those businesses that are really showing that environmental leadership uh, being ahead of the pack in offering that clarity because it's not um, it, it's not across the board that uh, the information is offered Right, which I think answers the next question that um, we had um, from Diana. We got from this one from email. It says, there's a trend of being green and using natural ingredients. Well, why doesn't everyone do it, especially if we know that some of these ingredients are so harmful to us? And is it just because we're just now being more aware of it? Well, it's a, it is an interesting question because it uh, it's a question that, that wonders what's the will. Uh, and uh, I think where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, the companies that uh, have been willing to do the environmentally and health friendly thing and get out there and uh, and be very careful about their ingredients, uh, you know, there are a number of, of businesses in Canada like yourselves right now leading in this area. Uh, and I think it's because uh, you wish to do the right thing and you're out there uh, making products that are safer for pe people and the environment. Um, but uh, there are some companies that are a little bit slower to respond in this regard and to change those formulations uh, to make those companies switch over. Um, it's, uh, you know, there might be great people working inside of those companies who, who are paying attention to this issue, but um, it really helps when there's consumer pressure to to generate will uh, within those companies to change those formulations. There's also a delay in terms of when new scientific studies come out about uh, some of the chemicals that have come up so far in, in the conversation. We heard uh, about phthalates earlier. That's uh, a chemical, uh, that's a group of chemicals that are uh, very common in fragrance ingredients. Not all companies are using them, of course. All the companies that we work with uh, in the Just Beautiful program uh, uh, don't use phthalates in their in their fragrances, so not everyone is using them. But uh, there are still some companies that do, and to uh, get those companies to completely stop using them, it's going to take uh, consumer pressure. Yeah, to echo that, sorry, to echo that for two seconds. So environmental defense doing great um, kind of advocacy type of work. Um, so the type of uh, consumer pressure we like to ask consumer to take it, just simply don't buy something if you believe is not living up to the highest standard of safety. When you don't buy something, they see the sales drop when, you know, things with formaldehyde or other preservative, when there's no consumer demand. So slowly, you know, they would eventually phase that product out. And I mean, you see that trend happening in the fast food industry when their sales keep dropping and dropping because now slowly people care about nutrition. So I think similar type of trend would likely happen in beauty if everyone start buying the right thing, buying the healthy version for beauty and body care products. So if we're going to make that, so assuming that we've got all the facts and, and we know that we need to look for our ingredients and make sure that the companies that we're searching for have their ingredients on, what are some of the, the first toxins that you know we should take out of our products? Which are the most products that we should trade in first? If you can only do a few at a time. I personally, oh yeah, sorry. Um, I personally feel anything you put on the vast majority of your skin area, like your body products, like you know, body wash, body lotion, anything that cover massive area of your skin, that's probably the best thing to take out. And mentioned earlier, deodorant, you know, like. That area, you know, is sensitive to potentially, you know, breast cancer and whatnot. That's another great, great thing to do. Um, another thing, I think people underestimate how sensitive, sensitive our skull is absorbing, you know, chemicals. So, I mean, for women, we love to take care of our hair. I feel anything, shampoo or conditioner that you use good amount and you like to kind of rub it in your skin. I think those are the like product that should start kind of phasing out first versus some time things that you might use it a few times a year um, 
that might be less important relatively. I think uh, in terms of uh, if people out there are wondering, okay, what should I take steps to phase out first? Uh, first, I would say the keyword is phase out. Uh, don't run around your bathroom throwing things into the garbage or something like that. That's not the, the you know, it's it's not the approach we advocate. We say phase out these things. So start buying, you know, finish what you have, but then phase in safer, healthier products. And some of the key chemicals to look for, I would say, are triclosan. Triclosan is an antibacterial chemical that uh, in waterways reacts with sunlight to produce dioxins. And uh, when it reacts with the chlorine in tap water, it, uh, the chemical reaction produces chloroform, which is a carcinogen. And triclosan itself is quite bad for aquatic species, so it has that environmental impact. Environment Canada has called it toxic to the environment, but it's still permitted in cosmetics. We're hoping to change that with our campaigns at Environmental Defense. But in the meantime, I would advocate for people to avoid triclosan, and that would be on the label. Now, something that's not on the label are phthalates. I love mentioning them because they're a villain in my world. Uh, phthalates are linked to all sorts of health problems uh, like asthma, uh, male health problems. So if a pregnant woman is exposed to phthalates, uh, it's something that can create a reproductive um, uh, system uh, problems in the male fetus. So it's associated with quite a few health problems. Uh, but you won't necessarily see phthalates on the label Phthalates are often hidden in fragrance. So the way to avoid them is to purchase products from companies that fully disclose what's in the fragrance ingredients. And of course, we're in a situation right now in Canada where there's just, you know, there's a pack of leaders, environmental and health leaders in business that are out ahead putting all that information on labels. I know I've toured the, uh, the Rocky Mountain uh, facilities and had my nose in the lavender that the lavender smell comes from. So I, uh, I know where, what ingredients are there. Uh, but not all companies are doing that yet. So I would really advocate for consumers to, um, to select products where all those ingredients are disclosed. Okay, so let's go um, back to the beginning then. So um, we have a question from Sue who says, we are delighted to be welcoming a new grandchild for our family this year. With all the warnings out there about toxins in the environment, what are some of the panel's most important recommendations for helping to give this new baby a healthy start? And also, just as a double kind of question, look, what are essential oils, and Tara, you could probably speak to this, um, what essential oils are safe for use during pregnancies and for babies? For pregnancy or for babies? Yeah. Oh, well, for pregnancy, it's usually we stay away the menagogue, which will stimulate the uterus to have contractions. So we have a list of that. I don't have it, unfortunately. Um, and then for babies, uh, lavender and mandarin essential oils are considered uh, safe in very, very small amounts. Um, just under the age of two, you have to be very careful because they are very powerful, and um, these things should be diluted appropriately. So if you're looking for something that's formulated for a baby, or, or use on infants, then it should be um, uh, very limited in what essential oils are in there. Um, lavender and mandarin would be ones to look for. Um, and for pregnancy, for rinse-off products, we generally consider um, most essential oils to be safe. We certainly don't work with ones that are considered toxic or um, um, known to have concerns, very, very high-level concerns. Um, other essential oils, when they're part of a fragrance or scent blend, a natural essential oil scent blend in a, in a soap, and it's a rinse-off product, we consider them safe. When it's a leave-on product, we will look at the menagogues and then make uh, cautions that way. Uh, we will also let women know that if they're concerned, because we don't know how often they're using a the product, if they're going to have a bath, um, with our bath salts or use our body lotion once a day or 10 times a day, then of course dosage becomes an issue. And you just can't know these things, so uh, it is a little bit up to the consumer to uh, educate themselves and consult their healthcare practitioner when they're not sure. So our body butter um, says use with caution during pregnancy. That would just be a, a usage, you know, just kind of see where you're going and how much you're using it during the day. Sorry, which product says that? The it says, um, I, we had a question, I purchased a body butter and noticed on the label it says use caution during pregnancy. Okay, sorry, I've got dogs now in the background. Um, the, body, the body butter, it would depend on which scent. Okay. So, essentially so it would just be a, a number of usage then, what you're saying. 
Yeah, it, it's, a, it's an amount of usage. More than likely, it, it'd be very hard for someone to have issues with the amount of or essential oil put in a body butter, but we don't know. Say it had a, you know, a high percentage of mint oil and they wanted to use it 50 times a day. That would be some concern for me. It's stimulating. Um, so it is, it is a little bit of a education for the consumer. They have to know what they're doing and we don't know how often they want to use something, so we will just leave it up to them to know what the list of amenagogues are and we can provide that in the store or on on our websites, and then from there they can um, make an educated choice as to what they're going to use and how often they're going to use it. Nicola, I think that just, oh, sorry, Karina. Sorry, go ahead. Um, with essential oils, they're, they're so concentrated, so we tend to err on a very cautious side um, with our products and, and recommending them for women when they're pregnant. But, you know, I've had three children. For me, it was just everything in moderation. I, I use a lot of essential oils for various um, remedies and on myself and my children. And and for me, it's just like Tara said, it's it's not overdoing it, using it in moderation. And I think when you're pregnant as well, your sense of smell is so heightened that you're you're not going to want to use strong products anyway. So if you're using any products, even outside of ours that have essential oils in them, I think the the basics is to to not overdo it, to use them in moderation, and as well, I think you're also going to be able to intuitively hold yourself back if the scents are too strong. You're not; it's not going to be appealing anyway. So, um, thanks, Karina. If we go back then and say um, to the first part of the question, like what are the recommendations for helping to give a new baby a healthy start? Um, We'd go back to what Lily said about the lotions and the washes and the shampoos. That would be the best start then? Yes. Yeah, I would say for uh, what you're washing the baby with, you should be extremely gentle. Um, unscented is often a good way to go to begin with too, to make sure you know if there's any issues. Um, right. Some say they have an issue uh, with the baby reacting or a young child reacting. I always want them to start with an unscented product so I know is it the base product causing a problem or is it the scent and this even though I know our scents are natural and safe it, anybody can have a reaction to anything so it's always better to start very gentle very little to no scent and then go from there um, yeah it, it, it horrifies me that people still use some of the things that were used on me as a, as a child <laughs> um, mainstream that um, those really harsh detergents and, and nasty scents that are just so strong um, are still being used on, on really young children and they have no choice because their parents are getting it for them. Babies don't need a lot of products. Like if you, if you think about, you know, you know like I, I guess you need a little bit of mild soap um, to wash them. You can use some mild Castile soap as, as a shampoo for babies. They don't typically have a lot of hair. And, you know, with my kids, I, I didn't add a moisturizer unless they needed it. It wasn't, I think we can get carried away as a society to have, you know, your change table with six, eight different products, but I, I would challenge you that how much do you really need? I think we can get rolled up in, in having all these products for our babies, but I don't think we need a lot until, you know, unless, you know, they're going through diaper rash and then I would have used something, but I think limiting the amount of products you use as well. Babies don't need a lot. Mm -hmm. There's a one interesting um, antidote when we got user submission about baby product is uh, we discovered one of the user submission probably from more like the Latin America area that um, submitted a Johnson 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 baby fragrance. So Johnson Johnson at one point apparently this develop a fragrance for a baby only. Um, so we did some research on it. Um, it's not so anywhere and pull off the shelf very quickly. So when we post it to our social media, we got a lot of interesting comments and they all feedback as I wonder why do baby actually need a fragrance when baby smell is supposed to be most amazing and natural. So it's a very interesting thing that we notice in the submission database, like why would company even think that actually you know, baby actually need a synthetic fragrance to cover this smell. So this is some of the interesting thing that we notice when we see you use a submission. So yeah, this apparently this exists at one point of time that, you know, 
some companies think that maybe actually need a need a fragrance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I always hear about how famously uh, babies smell good, and some of my friends have babies, and I would I wouldn't think they need to perfume. They're their own kind of perfume, right? Yes. So, yes, yeah. Okay. Some uh, some things to consider when if you're thinking about a new baby, if you, if uh, if you're pregnant or you're welcoming a new baby into your home, uh, it's not just the cosmetics, but uh, one of the easiest ways to reduce uh, your exposure and your baby's exposure to toxic substances in the home is to just keep house dust under control and mind that indoor air pollution. So. Uh, indoor air pollution can come from the use of heavily scented products like cleaning products and things like this. So being careful to, uh, you know, being careful about what the fragrance ingredients are so that they're more on the natural side or they're, un, you know, or they're without fragrance is, is great. Um, but also making sure you have a little bit of ventilation if you're doing stuff like cleaning uh, and, uh, and opening those windows. And then to reduce your house dust, uh, it's a very interesting thing. We did a study at Environmental Defense on uh, newborn babies and cord blood samples from newborns. And we found some shocking results now in low levels, so I don't want to panic parents, but we found certain pollutants that you wouldn't expect in a newborn to be there. And one of them was a pesticide, for instance. And when we spoke to the lab that, um, that had conducted the testing for us, they explained that, you know, this is the kind of thing that can p persist in your house dust. Things like flame retardants or pesticides that have been banned a long time ago, they don't break down very easily. Uh, Tara mentioned this about some certain chemicals don't break down very easily, and those substances can end up in house dust. So if you take a, a, a wet cloth and you wipe up some of that dust and you reduce your house dust with a wet cloth, uh, that can help reduce that source of exposure. Not eating on a couch, if you have an older couch that probably has flame retardants in it, not e eating your dinner on that couch will help reduce uh, the amount of dust you're consuming. If you're pregnant, that's something to consider. And, uh, and opening a window sometimes for the airflow in your home because, uh, you know, as much as we'd like to think otherwise, Canadians spend most of our time indoors, unfortunately, especially at this time of year. So, so indoor air is something we have to be mindful of. Um, we have a lot of questions um, uh, from um, the, the readers about um, the how useful natural products are when compared to conventional products um, and and their expiry date. We actually got a lot of questions about um, the expiry date on natural products. Um, Karina, did you want to talk a little bit about the expiry, and then we'll get into um, you know how they're useful compared yeah, to Yeah, you know what, products. I'm very passionate about this um, because I know, I think it, uh, it's called EOS lip products have been getting some negative publicity over social media for, for their products going moldy and while that absolutely is never a good thing, I think as, a, as consumers we have to also wrap our head around that cosmetics it, it reminds me of that documentary that came out. Um, I think it was called Super Size Me, and they the guy had taken McDonald's French fries and left left them. I think it was in his basement for weeks, and they never grow grew mold, and they're potatoes. So, you know, I I, I link that to our industry, and I think, you know, we we actually want our cosmetics to grow mold at at a certain point, because to me that means it's more natural, it's healthier for you. It so 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 bear with me for a second. So if you're if you the alternative to that of the of the French fries that never go moldy is cosmetics that never ever ever go moldy. If you think about that for a second, you, let's say I'm using a product that's ten years old, it's never grown mold. I mean I have lotion. My grandmother had a face cream that was around probably for twenty years. Mm -hmm. um, and it still smelled and looked as good as it did probably when she bought it. And it's still in her house even though she passed away years ago. It's sitting in her medicine cabinet. Nobody's ever removed it. And I saw it this summer and I thought, you, the, when you put that on your body, that part of that product is going to be absorbed into the skin. And the more science that comes out um, today shows us that it's more and more, it's more than we've ever thought is getting absorbed by the skin. So if you think about that, those ingredients that are preserving that product are, are persisting in the body. And at first we used to say, oh no, they're not getting persisted, they're, we're excreting them through our urine. And then years went by and said, oh actually we did find some, um, in, some in some tissue now, and it happens to be uh, cancer tissues, 
but it's not necessarily linked. And I and I agree. How do you know that that you know those ingredients cause the cancer? It, it it's loosely linked. But the idea that natural products are not meant to be around forever. So when you buy your face creams and your lotions and your soaps, I, I think the intent has to be that you you want to use them within a few months, maybe a, up to maximum a year. Certainly if they're opened, you want to use them. And that's not always the case. Again, we like to buy lots of different things in Bath and Body and we keep on, we hold on to them. It's a popular gift item. And we keep all of these things because they smell nice, they look pretty, but they're not meant to be kept. Natural products are not meant to be kept. And it's okay that after you know one or two years they grow mold. I think you want that. To me, that's a good sign. So um, let's just go from there and then we'll just talk a bit about how they can how natural products are as good as, if not sometimes better than conventional, say, drugstore products. Um, we have a couple of questions about eczema. And uh, uh, some of the questions have been that they've been on the steroid that they've got from their doctor, uh, which we don't want to stop people from doing, but it's not working. So what are the, some of the solutions that we could, the natural solutions that we could use to, to help um, skin irritations and that sort of thing? Hmm. Well, in terms of, uh, in terms of natural products versus products you might find at, at uh, a larger uh, store that's a, that's a brand that's everywhere whatnot uh, that doesn't uh, take great efforts to uh, have more natural ingredients and healthier uh, substances. Um, some of those products can be very harsh. Uh, the products that people typically use can sometimes have those harsh sur surfactants. So going to companies that are more careful about using natural ingredients and ingredients that are healthier for people and the environment, often the things that are not in that product are the products that are irritating skin in the first place. For instance, um, some uh, surfactants that uh, often uh, there's a lot of attention on our, our SLS and SLES and, and these are irritants to the skin and uh, but companies that have a policy about using uh, natural ingredients like the companies that are part of the Just Beautiful Network and Rocky Mountain these companies are not using some of those harsh ingredients so that's um, that speaks more to prevention than if you already have a skin uh, a skin condition and, and if you already have eczema then um, you're going to need to look into several options uh, but I myself actually have a tendency to get eczema in winter and I find that for me um, when I when I made the switch uh, to gentler uh, products and became more careful about what ingredients are then I tended to no longer get eczema in winter now that's just me personally it's not uh, meant to be a survey of everyone uh, but I think uh, using uh, natural products with, with gentler ingredients is one way to just uh, make sure your skin is less likely to get irritated in the first place and would you say that a healthier lifestyle, like drinking more water and vegetables, did you, would you say that that also contributes to healthier skin as well? Oh yeah, for sure. If you're um, if you're staying well hydrated, that's one of the main ways to have healthy skin. Make sure you're well hydrated. Uh, things like rest. I know that's uh, you can't purchase rest from a store. Unfortunately, I wish we could, but but uh, things like uh, getting rest and and staying well hydrated can go a long way to healthy skin as well. Great. Um, uh, let's go to hair because we got a lot of questions about hair as well. Um, so, with curly hair or thin hair, like what is the best way then, the natural way to to keep hair? Um, you know, can we put oils on them? Can we put essential oils on them? Uh, at Rocky, we have you know a line of sh shampoos and conditioners. But what else is good for doing that? You know, I remember when I was a kid, we used to put egg on our hair. <laughs> like that's still that's still good. <laughs> Well, I, if anybody's read "Let in Your Lipstick" by Jill Deacon, there's a there's a section in there about uh, how she actually tried the I can't remember the name of it. Maybe you guys can pop in on on this if you remember. But to actually not wash your hair, and then she did a, a vinegar rinse instead to to maintain the pH of her hair. Um, and I've seen that pop up on social media a bit as well. Um, so that's an extreme way to naturally take care of your hair. Um, certainly not for everybody, but it's interesting to me. I think that's the no poo movement, right? Yes, that's mm -hmm. what it is. That's right. No poo. It's funny when you're six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I um I I went through an adventure where I did a blog about experimenting with uh with the lead in li your lipstick uh, recommended method about uh using some uh baking soda and then rinsing with apple cider vinegar and uh it's not my preference in terms of hair products I prefer personally to have some shampoo and conditioner but I have long very thick hair that can get very coarse and it can get oily at the scalp and dry at the ends. So my preference is to use uh, a natural uh, shampoo with natural ingredients, you know, environmentally friendly product, um, but only use it uh, about every four days. And then what I like to do is put oil just on the ends of my hair and that helps create balance. So I'm noticing in uh, places like health food stores and places where I go to pick out my uh, products, I'm finding there are a lot of hair oils uh, on the shelves now, which I love. They're great for the ends and uh, that's, that's my preference. But I also find that now and then if my hair is feeling not so great, um, an apple cider vinegar rinse can, can bring out a lot of shine. So uh, that's something I'll do on occasion, though I'm not part of the no poo movement, uh, I have to confess. Yeah. <laughs> I can't go no poo. It's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I saw it and I think it's really interesting, especially with the natural oils that they're supposed to be in your hair. I just... Yeah, but you know, um, even um, even my hairdresser, uh, you know, she asked me, well, how often do you shampoo your hair? And I said, oh, every four days. And she said, oh, that's actually really great. If you have long hair, less often is good. And when you think about the products that we use, it's not just a question of uh, what's in the product, but how often we use it. If we're if we're using a bit less shampoo or free, or doing it less frequently, it means we're using a little bit less hot water. And small steps like that are a contribution to uh, to conservation in, in environmental terms. I think um, it's before, Oh, sorry, Lily. Oh, no, sorry. I think it's someone else, yeah. Oh. Sorry, we're all talking at once. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think it, it's quite a North American fascination to, to consume more, bigger, better, everything, and, and we're quite excited to go through bottles of shampoo and try them all out and wash our hair every day. That's how, when I grew up, that was very popular, and it was only... Um, later, when I met um, more people that aren't from Canada, uh, that have lived in other countries or born in other countries and lived there till their 30s, it's just they don't wash their hair every day. Like that, they just can't fathom why you would do that. Um, and so I think, like anything, we we overdo everything over here. We tend to overuse. We've got, like Karina mentioned, we've got way too many products. Why does your your morning and evening routine need to involve 25 different cosmetics and products and um, and we've kind of fallen into that trap, so now we're trying to go a little bit more, keep it simpler, keep it natural, what do you really need, um, start your kids off that way, and it's just great to see people coming around to that, you know, slowly, because the marketing um, is, is huge for mainstream cosmetics and, and just selling you what you think you need, um, commercials and, and all of that kind of thing, so if... And, and families start thinking more for themselves about how much money am I dumping into cosmetics each year and, and products that uh, um, maybe aren't even necessary. It would it would just help everything, right? The whole sustainability thing and and uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So I'd just like to speak. Um, we've only got a few uh, 15 minutes left. Um, I'd just like to speak really quickly about our ingredients. I know that Rocky has a plan to go GMO free. Um, fairly soon, and um, and one of them, I remember, one of them has come up a couple times is the cottonseed oil um, that we use. So there's been a couple questions about some of the ingredients that we use at Rocky and whether they're organic or not organic. Um, do we do we want to talk about about that and then why that's important um, about that? I, I just sorry, while I just before I interrupt you. Um, I read one of our old blog posts from 2013 where we stopped using a certain type of uh, vanilla because the vanilla was um, a bad vanilla. So did you guys want to talk a little bit about the ingredients that and why we choose them over um, other ingredients? Do you want to talk about GMO specifically, Nicola? Or? Sure, we'll talk about GMOs, yeah. So Tara, feel free to jump in on this. Um, so GMO is is important to us because it it to me it goes out it goes in keeping with organic and the move to organic it's just it's the right thing to do um, I, I guess and correct me anybody can jump in on this as well but I'm not aware of any negative publicity of GMOs where they've actually been harmful to health but I know that in the bigger picture uh, 
in the in context of GMOs being out and, and being very prevalent in society and in food and there's there's problems more I guess on not so much with health and safety at this point but more on being able to track GMOs and the long-term effects of GMOs and then the effect on agriculture and farming and the environment and so for us you know we've been watching the GMO debate for many 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 years uh, it was about maybe three or four years ago where we decided to make a move towards being GMO free at the moment it's just our soap our bar soap only that has GMO and we've actually reformulated all uh, 23 of our soaps to be GMO we're waiting to move into our new building in August uh, because we need uh, some some more kettles in order to be able to actually make all of the soap it with the new recipe and to be GMO free um, but I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks on GMO and why it's important that we would want to see GMO free products in Bath and Body I think personally I agree with you like when it comes to whether it's good or bad for us there's still some sort of debate happening um, from a fair personal viewpoint is GMO uh, crops uh, naturally demand more pesticide, herbicide. Um, I mean, from that perspective, why would you want pesticide, herbicide actually in your food? And also, I find it's a simple right to actually know what actually in your food. So, I think the effect or health effect might be up for debate. But if you know, if it's fine, then why can we label it and everyone can know if it's actually in it? So imagine if you are a vegan or a vegetarian, you would want to know if there's something actually have animal byproduct, and then you can make a choice. I think the right to know and the right to make a choice for yourself. If I decided not to have certain thing, that kind of you know the key and because obviously there's no regulation for the labeling factor, so. Personally, I would support brand like you know Rocky Mountain that would chose GMO free because I know they're making an important statement that match my belief system, which slowly I feel this generation of consumer they're not only buying a product, they're buying what the brand is standing behind. Does the brand match my personal value? If it does, I would support more. Um, they're less likely just be convinced by one ad campaign, and coming from an advertising world, which is a very <laughs> madman way of thinking, I can sell consumer my one TV campaign, two billboard ad, and three magazine ad. That I don't think is the new generation of consumer. They really dig deeper. What's the brand story? What's the owner belief? Is this brand actually owned by five different uh, multinational company, five different parent company? They each have different policy. You know, so I think. Having a principle to support something, even though you know there's no form of regulation to standardize yet, make a very powerful statement what your company stands for. So personally, I would support company that match my personal value and my personal belief is I would not, would avoid it until for sure it's proven it's safe because there's still gray area whether it's 100% safe or it's not. Being able to know is kind of important for my personal choice. Um, now for me, um, in terms of agriculture, my agricultural knowledge is limited. This isn't an area that uh, environmental defense works in a great deal. We have some work on pesticides and and uh, and issues specific to that, uh, but we don't have any campaigning going on on GMO specifically. So I'll just say that so uh, people don't have the impression that I'm coming in as someone with a PhD in this issue specifically. You know, so um, I will say I haven't seen seen evidence uh, linking GMOs directly to health problems, uh, but I do think consumers really want to know what's in a product, and, and they should have that information. It's something that people want to know how how products are made and where it comes from and, and they should have that information um, but you know apart from the health uh, the health aspect of, of GMO ingredients um, what I have seen is studies uh, that associate uh, or information that associates GMOs with greater pesticide use so in terms of how um, how the ingredient is produced 
uh, in some cases, um, the modifications are there so that more of a certain pesticide is used. Now, in terms of that issue, that does create, uh, there, there are environmental, valid environmental uh, concerns there. So um, I am not an expert in the issue, so I don't want to say a great deal, uh, but I think it's important that um, consumers have access in, to information that they want. And, and in terms of, um, from my limited uh, knowledge of the issue, uh, there, is, there is that issue with pesticide use. And an increase in pesticide use, which is a, which is something that uh, that I that I have a concern about. Tara, did you have anything to add? Um, I think Karina sort of touched on my concerns. It would be um, agricultural. Uh, we don't know what the long-term effects are, so I, you know, if <laughs> it's not the way nature intended, I'd prefer to stay away from it. Um, I don't know what the long-term effects are. Um, we've gotten so far removed from nature already in how we live and how we eat. We eat, we don't eat in season. We eat very different things year round. We, you know, we don't um, get the rest we need in the winter. We're just we're very different culture than we were 50 to 100 years ago. Um, and a lot of things have improved, of course, but a lot of things have gone ass backwards, sideways. I think so. Um, I think it is great that we're uh, getting our soap. Uh, out of the GMO realm, and um, I'm really excited about it, and, and it's a beautiful recipe, so I can't wait to see the feedback when we launch it. Okay, well, we're, we're six minutes in, so I know that there was a lot of questions today. We had about 500 questions, um, which there's we just didn't have time to get through. Um, so um, I'm going to work with Abby and Marketing to see how we can get a lot of these questions answered. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming today. Thank you to Lily from uh, Think Dirty. So Think Dirty is a mobile app that you can use on your iPhone and Android's coming, is that right? Coming soon, yes. Coming soon. And um, you can scan your product and it'll let you know um, where your product fits on the scale. Actually, Lily, did you just really want to speak just really quickly about how you yeah. come up with that thing? Because that was one of the questions that how you get to the point of where they are on the scale. The uh, okay, so first of all, we look at a bunch of limited lists that we can get a hand of. Um, so even though the US and Canada doesn't have a very robust kind of list, um, the EU do have a list of 1,300 um, chemicals that they are kind of restricted. So from there, we look at that list. And then the next list that we look on is actually from the state of California. They have a list called Proposition 65, and they have a list of 124 um, potential carcinogen and a bunch of, you know, not very good chemicals. And then from that onward, we also look at a few um, lists, which one of them is the Whole Food uh, Premium Body Care Standard. So they have a good list of uh, potentially not very good chemical, and Environmental Defense Canada have the 10 chemical and a few other nonprofit also have a list so we consolidate all of this list um, so anything on those lists are start from kind of the red zone and then from that we define the degree depends on how strong the evidence how conclusive it is um, we err on the precautionary side which follow the precautionary principle how you regulate their chemical so unless it's hundred percent proven safe um, we would err on that precautionary side so and then when there's absolutely nothing actually found then will be the absolute clean spectrum so the tricky part is the middle zone, um, whether you are, you know, the the cleaner yellow or, you know, the lower green, that's the tricky part to sometimes draw the clear line. Um, that's the area that we are working really hard to make it more clear. Um, but for the first year, which is the past, when the first phase we launch, we kind of quickly divide the section. And then the next year onward, which is this year, we're working towards the middle, you know, the gray area situation that we talk about. There's not a simple clear cut for sure is yay or nay. It's more like different shade of grace in between that we kind of have to tackle that. So that's the very simplest explanation of how this works. But if you look on our app, um, every rating and the top right corner, you see a little question mark. You just tap that little rating box, we have a full rationale actually explain how the rating works. 
And um, as soon as we have more and more and more information, we're going to keep updating that section. So, and also under our website, under methodology, in the above tab, we also explain our methodology there with all the resources included there as well, like which list we look at. Um, there's a bunch of over 20 lists that we look at. So um, that should hopefully clear up some of the concern how we come up with that rating scale. Okay, thanks, Lily. So again, the app is called Think Dirty. Uh, it's on iOS and Android coming soon. Um, and uh, you just scan your product and it will come in. Thank you again to Maggie McDonald, who works for Environmental Defense. Um, environmental Defense um, helps ca Canadians reduce their exposure to cancer-causing and hormone-disrupting chemicals found in everyday products. Um, their labs tests have found toxic chemicals in, in from newborn babies, heavy metals in makeup, toxic ingredient in men's body care products, and the dangerous antibacterial triclosan in Canadian bodies. Uh, you can learn more at environmentaldefense.ca. To Tara Martinson, our own um, herbalist at Rocky Mountain Soap Company, and also to Karina, who is the co-owner and um, CEO of Rocky Mountain Soap Company. Um, if anyone has any questions, the uh, hashtag tonight is Toxin Free Chat. I'll be online, as I always am, behind the Rocky Mountain's uh, Twitter <laughs> feed and Facebook page. And thank you, everyone else, uh, for watching. Um, this will be recorded, so we can, if you missed a bit, we can uh, replay it later. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Nicole.